get a job, get an agent, get a good job, get a good agent. <laughs> okay. And what is important for young actors out there to know that the first part is getting the job, not getting the agent. A quick transport to your, your lovely garden here. Um, and beautiful weather, so we can't beat that. No. I, uh, I think it would be good for, listen, from my opinion, there's a lot of people that over the years, we've heard this whole six degrees of Kevin Bacon thing. I firmly believe it's like three degrees of Stephen Tobolowsky. <laughs> <laughs> because just running down the everything that you have got to be a part of and bring your talent to, you start to realize everybody's had to act with Stephen at some point, yeah. you know? So why don't you tell us a little bit how you ended up into acting? Well, I always wanted to be an actor, even when I was a little kid. And I wanted to be an actor because for the strangest of reasons that I thought monsters were real. Uh, Godzilla was real. In fact, that was one of the first movies I ever saw was Godzilla. I thought it was a documentary. I didn't know that it was fiction. I thought the earth was populated with giant lizards and and let's stay away from Japan at all costs. <laughs> Get the oxygen destroyer now. <laughs> uh, but I thought if I became an actor, I could hang out with Frankenstein and the Wolfman and Dracula, and we could all be friends. And that was what propelled me into acting. And then in college, I thought acting was noble. I, I just started reading Shakespeare and Shaw and Chekhov and Ibsen. And I go, oh my goodness, Eugene O'Neill, this is magnificent. I wanna be a part of the fabric of this. And of course, back then there was no, let's do TV, let's do movies. No, that was like, <laughs> no. Legitimate actor for the legitimate stage. Well, the theater. The theater, <laughs> you know, acting. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, you know, and, and even when I was in college at SMU, uh, film and television, how many, screenplays do you think I read in the acting department at SMU? Oh, I wouldn't, I have no clue. Zero. Wow. None. Not one screenplay, not one teleplay. It was all about theater. You know, like we're gonna make our lives doing Bertolt Brecht plays. Like that's yeah, gonna happen. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I got propelled into a world of unemployment uh, of what appeared to be endless possibilities of unemployment, <laughs> like it's never going to happen. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, Beth and I, we had to make a decision. Do you want to go to New York for theater or Los Angeles for not theater? Mm -hmm. And we made the decision again, based on something as pragmatic that monsters are real, is that it's easier to be poor in Los Angeles. That was it. So we came out to LA. So then it became a matter not of doing theater, but of getting any kind of acting work you could. And so, oh gosh, I began, I tried to say yes to anything I possibly could. The, I had an acting teacher, Ed K. Martin, that said, always say yes to any possibility. And the first day, the first week I came to Los Angeles, I went to an acting class that he recommended. And someone walked into the acting class and said, we're doing the play Time of Your Life and we lost the part of Dudley Boswick. We opened this week, can anyone volunteer? I go, I'll do it, I'll do it. They said, well, if you could come by the theater today and audition. I auditioned for Dudley Bostwick, and if you don't know what the play is, it's everybody kind of sitting around in a bar, waiting around with different stories in and out, but Dudley Bostwick is not in the bar. I am in a different location, waiting for my girlfriend, trying to, and I'm talking on a payphone. So it cuts from the bar to me on a payphone, waiting for her. So opening weekend, the most amazing thing happened. And that is Fran Bascom, one of the most important casting directors in Los Angeles at the time. She was doing all the big television shows, you know, just about everyone you could possibly imagine. Fran was the one with her finger on the pulse. And she came to see, and everyone was talking backstage. And I thought, this is my opportunity to make 
a real impression on a casting director. So I went out for my first monologue on the telephone, the payphone, and I start talking on the payphone and the payphone falls off of the wall. <laughs> it's on the ground. So I am not going to quit. I continue, so I change hands with this, and I pick the payphone off the ground. And if you know payphones, they're very heavy. heavy. So now I continue walking around the stage, <laughs> holding an entire payphone in my hand, talking on the receiver, and the cord going from the payphone to the receiver <laughs> falls out. So now I'm holding you gotta keep a it receiver, going the whole time. and I keep it going, and I put the payphone down, and I just stand there with the receiver and I finish the speech. And I am at, I go into a pit of hell that is so deep you cannot possibly <laughs> imagine that I did this in front of Fran Bascom. Oh that week, I get a call from Fran Bascom's office. She wants to have a meeting with me. Oh and I God. went, what? And I picked, and, and Beth gave me the phone and I go, yes, Miss Bascom. You, 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 you want to see me after that? And she said, Stephen, the kind of actor we want is the kind of actor that's going to keep going when they lose the phone, when they lose the cord. That's what we want. And from then on, Fran Bascom became one of my heroes uh, in, in Los Angeles. She brought me in for auditions for just about everything I could imagine. And, and that began me on the long winding road of doing TV shows everywhere. And, and from then it was a matter of how do you get into films and, and how do you get into good films? Yeah. We, we, we had a mantra back then is get a job, get an agent, get a good job, get a good agent. <laughs> okay. And what is important for young actors out there to know that the first part is getting the job, not mm -hmm. getting the agent. Everyone comes out here thinking like, well, I'm going to get the agent, then I'm going to work. You have to get your own work. Mm -hmm. And then and then your career can take off if you do that. And that pretty much is what happened to me. I had a series of very bad agents. Agents, I remember my one agent asked me to bring some 8x10s over to his house. So I had to get 8x10s made then brought him over to his house. And there was an old woman there with a bunch of cats in there. And I said, I'm sorry, is this the John LaRocca agency? Oh, he left. He went to Chicago. He went to Chicago. So my agent left for Chicago and didn't even tell me. And now he rented the house out to his mother, I guess, or something with all of her cats. So I was very depressed because I felt like my career was going nowhere. And my girlfriend gave up acting pretty much. She said, well, maybe I'll be a writer. And I said, well, could you go into dentistry or something we could count on? You, you know, Continual income I mean, of some sort. Between being an actor and being a writer, it's just a toss up. And the first play she wrote, she won the Pulitzer Prize oh for gosh. drama. Go figure. So, so suddenly, you know, we were on this sort of track. And so the second play she wrote, I did in, I did in Los Angeles and I, I did it in the boonies in St. Louis and I did it in Buffalo, New York. And in Buffalo, New York, uh, I was doing the play with Catherine Grody, a wonderful actress from New York. And she said, Stephen, do you have an agent? And I go, well, I have a series of, <laughs> of agents of you. <laughs> in Los Angeles, you know, who are either there or not in town. She says, I want my agent to meet you. So she called her agent up, Jeff Hunter from New York. Jeff Hunter drove to Buffalo, saw us, Catherine and I, in the play together. And he called me the next day and said, do you have an agent? And I said, no, he says, you do now. I want you to come to New York on your day off. Do you need any money? Do you need a place to stay? I came to New York. I met Jeff Hunter. I had 20 auditions like within the next, on my days wow. off. Wow. And then Jeff was saying, I'm moving to Los Angeles. So you will become part of my agency in Los Angeles. And I, I went from having no agent to having DHKPR, big agent, Jeff Hunter, 
Kimball wow. Parsegian, uh, yeah, David Kimball. I mean, big agency. And suddenly now I was, the formula was correct. Right. I got work. I got an agent. I got good work with Beth's play. Yeah. And I got a good agent and that was with perfect. Jeff Hunter. Yeah. And the, uh, the kind of epilogue of that little story mm -hmm. is that in 2002, I was nominated for a, a Tony Award, right. uh, which means I didn't win. Or I would have said, <laughs> I, I won. won a Tony Award. <laughs> <laughs> I was nominated for a Tony Award for, for featured actor in mm -hmm. a play. And who comes to our opening night party of, of the awards party? Jeff Hunter mm. in New York. And I went up to Jeff and I said, Jeff, I need to thank you so much. Mm. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for you. You really started my career. And he says, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, you came to see me do a play in Buffalo, New York, and you called me up and you said, you have an agent. I did what? <laughs> I said, you you did all this for me. He said, Stephen, if you say that happened, it happened. I have no recollection of that at all. Good luck. So that was my epilogue. That's and that, and there is a haiku of that about this agency, about life in this business, is that it's filled with enormous ups and downs, things you can't predict or prepare for, absolutely great fortune and absolute disaster. And look what we have here. Oh, Ladies right. and gentlemen, we have a crow cat. We have crow kitty here. <laughs> this is exactly what we need to make this interview sing. <laughs> crow kitty, come on over here. <laughs> This is not my cat. Oh. <laughs> this is this is a neighborhood cat that he's so dear, but he comes over all the time. Just hangs out. Hangs out with me. Well, why wouldn't he, you want to hang out here? No, he he hangs out here and he but that that is kind of how I got onto the track of of doing movies and getting good auditions was through Jeff Hunter, was through DHKPR, Triad and now I'm with Innovative Artists, a fabulous uh, agency, and I've been with them for, God, almost two decades. Wow. Show. Yeah. So what was that time period like between the good work, the good acting, the good the good agent, like, or the, you know, getting a job to getting a good agent? What was that time period? Filled with depression. <laughs> and and, and <clears throat> the thing about depression that you forget when you're on the other side of depression mm -hmm. is there's no clock attached to that depression. Sure. Every hour feels like it's endless. Mm -hmm. You have no way out. You have no potential for any future. You don't even know what you could. I had an opportunity when I came out here. No agent would see me. I couldn't get I couldn't even get in line to see an agent. No one would let me come in an office. Uh, so we found an opportunity to perform in public where you could pay $100 to a producer, like someone like you. I pay you $100 and we'd have, uh, you can invite an audience to see you do a scene. And it was not money well spent. No one came. Shocking. The only people that came were Beth, my girlfriend, and the friend and his girlfriend. And, and and they were saying while we're doing the scene, we could have done this in the living room and <laughs> saved the hundred dollars or spent it on beer. You know, this is like wait, good beer. <laughs> so it was it was very hopeless. In fact, I had friends saying, You need help. We can't be around you anymore because it's too depressing to be around mm. you. You know, so you, you need to pull yourself out of this somehow. Mm. So that that's what that was like. Yeah. But the, the the epilogue is hard work. Turn the corner and you find yourself. Here, the epilogue is this. Yeah. If you the real epilogue, are we are we okay here? We okay. Yeah, the sun the sun has shifted a bit, and so you're getting a little too much highlight. Do you want me to shift? Let's go ahead. It looks up. Mm -hmm. Take three markers. <laughs> All right, you said you remember yeah. where we left off. I remember where we left off. Are you guys ready? We're ready. We're Excellent. On. Yeah. See, we had to protect ourselves from the sun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I am too much in the sun. That's what Hamlet says. Oh, that's right. I am from Hamlet. You know, uh, you're in the dark. No, my, no, mother, I'm too much in the sun. 
Uh, anyway, well done. Where we were was with the epilogue of, of, of the, what I learned. The journey, the, yeah. The journey of the hard times. The point I missed last year before the end of the world with COVID. <laughs> yes, we do have masks. Six feet apart. Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're six feet outside. Uh, we're, we're we're close. The I always thought that that was the epilogue. Is that don't be discouraged. Make your own work. Make your own breaks. Keep going no matter what. You never know when a good break is around the corner. And that certainly has an amount of truth to it. But there's a, I thought, a more potent epilogue for young actors starting. I, I was just doing uh, the Goldberg spinoff School, which wasn't picked up for a third season, unfortunately. But the last episode I shot, they had a young fellow on the set, his, his first part. His name is Justin. His dad was with him very excited. His heart was beating, you know, he didn't have any lines, but he had to walk down the hallway and high five the, uh, one of the leads of the show. So he was like practicing, you know, mm -hmm. you know how that is. <laughs> Let me practice. He's been high five, low five. Don't you tie, don't you do Whatever. Well. Yeah. So the father asked me, is there any advice you can give Justin on starting out? And I was going to give that piece of advice about don't be discouraged, even though you're enormously discouraged. And then it dawned on me, wait a minute, my first job on television, what was that? My first TV comedy role was on the TV show, Alice. The casting director, Mindy Marin, called me at home and said, Stephen, we lost our caveman Carl. Caveman Carl was a rock and roll DJ like Wolfman Jack. Okay. And if you okay. were of a certain age, you remember Wolfman Jack. And I had crazy hair then and all this. She says, can you come in, read with Beth Howland, who, who's a regular, you'll do the scene with her, let the director work with you. And if it's all okay with everybody, you'll go right into hair and makeup, right into costume. And we shoot the show in front of a live audience today. Now, can you do that? And I go, sure. So uh, I went over, I learned my lines. I read back then I could learn them quickly. I did it, did the scene got the part, we shot that day. It just dawned on me when I was talking to Justin this year, this last year, Mindy Marin never called me in to audition for that part to begin with. Mm. In my past with Mindy, I had auditioned with her a half a dozen times, never got a call back, never got an even attaboy great job, never got nothing. Mm. She called me at the last second, because their caveman Carl fell out, either he got sick or he got another job or something, they needed someone. Mindy called me, not because of my successes with her, but my failures had impressed her enough to where she was going to count on me when their backs were against the wall. Yeah. And if you're a young actor, you always beat yourself up for all of the failures you had in, in, your auditioning life, when you don't get a call back, flagellation. No, if you realize that you're living in a world where even your failures could be leading to your success, it's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. You are seeing a completely different set of circumstances. So don't give up hope. Mm -hmm. When you give up on your dream, you're in the worst shape possible because you are making the thing you want to do the most in the world your enemy. And you turn yourself on yourself. And that's when you become terribly depressed. Yeah. And drink too much beer, watch science fiction films, and <laughs> get loaded every night. Well, two things. I've heard it, I, I've heard it talked about being like failing up, like how you fail upwards. Like there's you know, people automatically think you know, it's a drop down, but. They talk about how when you fail, fail up. Like how, what's the learning and then how, like kind of what you're saying. How, how did you position yourself based on the, even the, even your failures brought you to that moment, right? So it's always working towards an upward And And I think, uh, again, to quote Shakespeare, the play is the thing, mm -hmm. not the fame is the thing. Right. If, if what you make is most important is the story, what is the story I'm telling? And you could be telling a great story like in Memento or in Groundhog Day, Yeah, a great story. Yeah. Or you could be telling a silly story like Caveman Carl <laughs> on Alice. You could be telling a story that, that doesn't have a lot of weight to right. it. 
uh, the story is always foremost. And if you submit to the story, mm -hmm. you give your heart and soul and mind to the story, good things will eventually happen to you. Yeah. That's okay. So two things. I, I you, you always throw out great quotes and I read something yesterday. You kind of touched on it. Uh, it, it went something like this, like, uh, uh, disappointment is brief. Regret is a lifetime. So it's kind of, it's the whole idea about following your passion. Like, so go after something. It may not happen. Oh, be disappointed. Uh, but if you don't go after it, you may regret it the rest of your life. Right. Take a look at a groundhog day. Yeah. Right. So I get offered after all of this TV stuff, a regular role on TV to play the tool time guy in home improvements with Tim Allen. Oh, I, was, I was hoping we'd talk about this. this, is, this is... I, I get, I audition, I go to the network audition, I get it. I am going to be a, on a TV show. Now we don't know that home improvements is going to be a success or not. They didn't even know exactly when they were gonna shoot it. And they were, and I'll throw money out. I'll tell you about the kind of money I was gonna make. I was going to make $16,000 an episode, which for me was a lot. When you're paying $100 <laughs> to be seen in public, for them to pay you $16,000 a week to do a TV show. And back then they were doing 26 episodes a year. Tim Allen, my God, right. the greatest uh, comedian of, of that era. Uh, it was a huge deal. The problem was, my wife was pregnant at the time, and I had to sign a contract saying that I would not work on any other show except Home Improvements whenever they got around to shooting it. Mm -hmm. And they were not sure if they were going to start shooting Home Improvements in 10 days or 10 months. And I said, I can't do that. I can't not work for 10 months and so I turned down what I always was trying to hope for, of, of being a regular on a show, which turned out to be enormously successful. <laughs> I would have been a multi-millionaire. <laughs> However, because I was free and didn't have any job, I was able to work at various things for that year. The baby came along, then I got groundhog. Mm. If if I had been doing Tool Time Guy on Home Improvements, I would not have been Ned Ryerson in Groundhog Day. So that, in a way, is failing up. Yep. Uh, I have found uh, same thing uh, recently uh, with the Mindy Show. Mm. You know, they yeah. basically fired me. Okay. Uh, it was it, it it hurt my soul. You, you know, uh, they wrote me out of the script mm. after we, we first started. And, you know, I did all the auditions. So I thought everybody liked me fine. And then I showed up for a, a read through of a script and no one was there. No one was in the room. Oh my the God. room was completely empty. And, you know, usually you have 50, 60 people, all the people involved with the show all empty. And I'm going like, and then one of the ADs walks in and sees me like, oh, hi. Um, you know, they want you to sign some autographs down there if you could do some for a charity thing. Uh, and I said, where is everybody? Someone will talk to you. Someone will talk to you soon. Okay. And they leave. So I go down to sign the autographs on the Mindy posters. And this young, the youngest writer, the writer staff comes out and looks at me like. <laughs> it was, it was like, you know, I was a booger. <laughs> It was like, it was terrible. You know, I'm going like, what's wrong? Uh, so uh, all he told me was, oh, um, they're, they're going to have some reshoots and uh, someone's going to call you when they redo the schedule. So I'm going like, okay, I smell. Hello, Cal. There's my little crow kitty over there again. <laughs> so I, I was I was smelling, I was smelling something bad. So I called up Stephen Levy, my manager. He didn't know anything. So I had Mindy's phone number. So I called up Mindy and she said, hi, Stephen, you probably know at this point that we're making a change and uh, we're writing your part out of the show. 
And I said, no, actually, this is the first time I've had, I got that bit of information. And, it, you know, it was crushing. It was heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, and you just have to deal with that. And of course, the Mindy show went on to be very successful. And they went on and years later, they asked me to come back and do an episode, which, which I did. And Mindy was saying like, thanks for coming back to doing the episode. You know, we, we weren't sure if you'd do it. <laughs> but because of that, mm -hmm. of not doing the Mindy show, uh, I was able to do Silicon Valley. Mm. I was able to do One Day at a Time. Yep. I was able to work with Norman Lear, yeah. my idol. So that's another way of failing up. Yeah. Man, it's so good. So good. Well, so you said that year that you moved away from home improvement was the year that these things opened up, which led to Groundhog Day that year. Some people may have heard the story that, that listened to your podcast. Uh, be sure to subscribe. It's free. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> it's free. The podcast is free. We did it for free. <laughs> we didn't mean to, but that's what we did. <laughs> so, so the story of you landing this role for this movie, I, you, I don't believe anyone could write this. Not it's, it's yeah. Not it's anyone a, on their best day uh, creatively to put these elements together and how you landed this part. Give us. Yeah, just I let was, us just play it out for us. I was I was in that situation where I was moving kind of from film to film, and they were kind of interesting movies. Uh, I had done Mississippi Burning with Alan Parker. I just which, watched that again this year. Which is an what we call an A film. And not only that, but Alan Parker had the cachet. No one knew if Mississippi Burning was a drama, comedy, musical, exercise video. Yes. No one knew what it was. But they knew if Alan Parker cast me, they should cast me. So suddenly I'm getting all of this work because I did Mississippi Burning. So I'm moving from film to film. And at the point before Groundhog Day, I was doing, um, yeah, I'm, I'm having trouble with nouns You're now. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm dragging with you. I, yeah, I, uh, Calendar Girl. Calendar Girl. Which was a wonderful, wonderful script. And the writer of that, brilliant writer, I think that was one of his last screenplays mm. because he said Hollywood broke his heart. Mm. That that it that you know it does yeah. that to people Dried sometimes. Up. Yeah. But uh, in that, I am playing uh, kind of a mafioso type guy with a, a brother who is what you what you call deaf and mute. Uh, played by Kurt Fuller, a great actor. And so Columbia at the time, Sony Pictures Columbia is teaching us sign language for the deaf. And so we do a lot of the part. Should I wait for this guy? Yeah. I'll wait for this guy just a little bit. We used to, you know, when we did Deadwood. Oh yeah. We were shooting at Disney Ranch and uh, we had this all the time. We just call it Western Air Airlines. <laughs> you know, we pause in our outfits, six shooters, wait for the plane to go. And now, all right, partner. Did you see, uh, you probably didn't see it, but they just reunited Timothy Oliphant and, uh, uh, what was his name? Um, the guy- Ian McShane? Uh, no, the other, the, the bartender Earl. No, um, what's his name? Big guy, beard. Uh, yeah. Earl Brown? Yes, Earl yeah, Brown. W. So, Brown. So they reunited them on one of the episodes of The Mandalorian recently. Oh, wow. So Favreau loved their chemistry so much, he wanted Timothy in the show. And there was a whole scene at one of these, you know, sci-fi, you know, Star Wars bars. And so he said, the only thing I could think of was to bring the, the guy back that you had the most chemistry with. So they, he reunited them Amazing. specifically so he could have them Amazing. Have that kind of chemistry back. See, there's the wonderful that cool side stuff? of the story. Yeah, that's amazing. Story. That's amazing. Okay, so you and Kurt. So, so we're doing. You so we're doing. We're playing brothers, and we're we're doing this uh, calendar girl, which uh, we're we're playing this the force of the bad guys coming to try to squat. You know, you've seen those kind of shows. <laughs> we're, we're the bad guys approaching our hero the force of badness mm -hmm. in, in the movie. And I get the audition for Groundhog Day. First audition for Groundhog Day. 
And I go in and I meet Harold Ramis and I, 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 I read for the part. And uh, as a side note, I remember Harold Ramis read with us. And he told me later he did it because actors always have to read with these readers, but he's a real actor. So isn't it better to read with a real actor? I said, well, Harold, you're also the director who's gonna hire us. So it's very scary <laughs> to read with you, you know. But I went in and I said like, I'm going to be very broad in this. In fact, it probably play in the Roman Coliseum. <laughs> so if it's too big, you know, I can, it's easier to tone down. And so I was all over Harold Ramis. I was zipping and unzipping his fly. I was like, polishing his shoes and I was doing the bing, bing, you know, I was doing the whole Ned thing with him and all that. And I drove the two hours and 20 minutes back to Paris, California, where we were shooting Calendar Girl. And for some reason, I've never been in a situation like this in my life. They didn't have enough motel space for everyone in the cast and crew. So for some reason, they put Kurt Fuller and I in the same Hotel room, you know, we, we had the uh, queen beds, you know, I mean, we're not in the same bed, but we're in separate beds. So I'm going like, well, this is an uncomfortable situation. Um, so we just start chit chatting, you know, at night, you know, like we're at summer camp. Well, what are you up to? And I knew that basically all actors want to know is, is that, um, And do you, do you see them in the background? Uh, on this camera, yeah. No, okay. Great. Well, I'll cool. just mention, I'll just mention that what we are preparing for in the background is uh, it's the end of the season with our bees. Okay. And so Madison is there and she's a bee expert and my wife is there. She's a bee fanatic. <laughs> Completely different from being a bee expert. <laughs> And we're going to, so we're smelling smoke now. So it's not that California is on fire again. <laughs> it's just that they're uh, going to look in our beehives. Oh, so great. anyway, uh, where I was, so Kurt and I are talking yes. and I'm just telling Kurt, like nothing, knocking on doors, nothing's going on. What are you doing? He says, well, actually I have something big coming up. Really, really nice. Uh, Harold Ramis is a friend of mine. I'm doing a new Bill Murray movie, uh, Groundhog. I'm playing this crazy character, Ned Ryerson, and uh, we've already started rehearsing and we had a re and I'm lying in bed in a pool of my own vomit. And I'm going like, this is, has the makings of a terrible story. I mean, this is going to be brutally terrible for somebody. And then I get the phone call that I got a call back. Oh, geez. So now I'm stuck with the situation of, do I tell Kurt, what, mm. what am I do, what is going on? Somebody is not getting the whole story. So I go back for the call back. I drive the two hours back to Los Angeles, audition with Harold Ramis again, get the, and back then we had these kind of cell phones or like, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> these kind, we didn't have this kind, we had these kind. And I got the call from my agent you got Groundhog Day. Ned Ryerson and Groundhog Day. I get back to Paris, California. Kurt found out that I got Groundhog Day. And he is hurt, furious. He has been betrayed. And it's, you know, how that happened, I don't know. I wasn't a part of that. So you had to go back to the set of Calendar Girl after he- And do, and, and act with Kurt after Stay in the same room still? Yeah. Oh God. Oh God. Oh, it was. Oh, no. It was. It was oh, amazing. No. Now, right after Calendar Girl, I fly up and I start shooting uh, Groundhog Day. The very first day of shooting, the, Bill, Bill and I started shooting the street scene first shot of the first day. Mm. My call was six thirty in the morning. Uh, I'm going to jump. I'll come back to this, yeah. but I'll jump ahead to, we finish the film and the Groundhog Day is going to premiere in Westwood. I show up at the premiere with Andy. Andy wanted me to come with her to keep the guys away from her. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a guy, negative magnet. <laughs> 
<laughs> and so, and so, uh, Kurt is there and said, uh, I'm going to watch the movie with you. And so I watched Groundhog Day, the premiere of Groundhog Day with Kurt. And at the end of the movie, Kurt said, well, you got my part, hurt my feelings, but at least you did a good job with it. Congratulations. And Kurt hugged me mm. and walked off. And I thought, that is what it takes to make it in Los Angeles, mm. to be a Kurt Fuller. Mm. Somebody with not only that kind of talent and that kind of resilience, but that kind of brass mm -hmm. to do that. Uh, and we have since worked, Kurt and I have worked together sure. again, yeah. in, which, in which he he got me back. <laughs> <laughs> he got me back plenty, but but he is a, and I, and I later on I asked Harold Ramis. I did a charity event with him in New Mexico, years after we did Groundhog Day, and I said, "What happened around Groundhog Day? You know, how did I end up getting that part?" And Harold Ramis started laughing. He says, "Oh, it's simple. He says you came in and auditioned." And right after you auditioned the first time, I called Bill and I said, I think we really have found our Ned Ryerson. This guy who just walked in is the most obnoxious person I've ever met in my life. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> so that's how I got the part of being the most obnoxious right. person Harold Ramis ever met in oh his my life. Gosh. But uh, I remember moving back to the logistics of that first day of Calendar mm -hmm. Girl, which is a really kind of behind the scenes bit of trickery in that one of the most important people in a movie is the line producer. And people don't know what that is. And that's the person who arranges schedules mm -hmm. as to when we shoot what when. Calendar Girl had the same line producer as Groundhog. So the line producer was able to do some magic because according to the rules, you're supposed to have 12 hours of rest in between when you work and when you come back to work. You're supposed to have a break as an actor. Right, right. But because we had the same line producer, they were able to bend the rules. Mm. So I finished shooting Calendar Girl on day one, drive to LAX, fly to Chicago, get a car ride to Woodstock, Illinois, end up in my in my room at the inn at about 2.30 in the morning with a 6.30 call. <laughs> so I had four hours sleep. Four hours to prep. Not, yeah, and not even four hours sleep because right. the first two hours is like, how am I ever gonna go to sleep? And then the next one, I can't oversleep because I'm first up. Right, right. And then, I just wake up and I look at myself in the mirror and I said, whatever you've done your entire life, forget it. You've got to be good today, now. Yeah. Now is when it counts. There'll be time enough to sleep when you're dead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> today, you've got to pull it all right. up. You, pull it you'll, together. You'll owe them. So I went down and met Harold Ramis and Bill Murray. And Harold Ramis wanted to introduce me to Bill and Bill, kind of pushed Harold aside and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And Bill goes, show me what you're going to do. And Bill is a big guy. Mm -hmm. He's intimidating. And so I, I started saying, well, I'm going to go like, <laughs> you know, whoa. You, you know, I started doing all that. He says, okay, you could do that. That's funny. <laughs> you could do that. And and we, we do that. And there were about 500 people from the town watching where we were going to shoot, right? Mm -hmm. And Bill looks out at him and says, you know what these people need? These people need donuts. I'm going, what? Follow me. And Bill, I follow Bill to the donut shop on the town square where we were gonna shoot me mm -hmm. meeting Bill. Mm -hmm. And Bill comes in and puts a wad of cash on the, on the table there and says, Give me every donut, every muffin, every Danish, every crew layer, whatever you've got. Let me have, and 
Bill starts stacking up these boxes of donuts in my arms. And we have all this, and we walk out of the donut shop and Bill starts throwing the donuts out <laughs> like fish to the seals. To, and the crowd starts cheering. And I gotta oh, say, there are like 500 people yeah. and they're roaring That's now. That's awesome. And, they're, and I'm thinking like, what a brilliant move on Bill's part. Mm. In that one second, mm -hmm. he created a bond between us and the town, yep. complete goodwill, and everybody got donuts. Yep. But we came out and I was very nervous to begin to shoot the scene. Bill's going to walk down. I'm going to, and everybody talks about, well, you and Bill must have improvised so much. The interesting thing about Groundhog Day, probably less improvisation in this movie than in any movie I've ever done, because the day has to be repeated. Yeah, it's got to be the same. Has to be the same. So I actually had a spot on the street where I had to hit with my left foot, turn, mm -hmm. raise the hand, the hand would be the same, oh, Bill, Bill Connors. I had to do it the same each time I did mm -hmm. it. And they had a, an assistant director, an AD, kneeling off camera, who was like this, doing that when I'm about to step on the rock, knowing that I'm about to, and, and the way, can I stand up yeah. a little? Can you, you I'll show I'll show you guys a professional tool of what we do in the tray. You okay? <laughs> you got me here? I got you. So what you do is like I'm supposed to talk to you like this. Yeah. Right? I'm supposed to talk to you like this. So what you do to prepare is you go, Don, now tell me when I'm out of frame. Okay. Right? Yeah. I'm out of frame. And I know it's bum, bum. Bomb. Yeah, three and I'm there. Yeah. So I know that I'm supposed to hit the spot in the street with this foot turn. Oh, Bill, Bill Connors, is that you? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I do the, okay, here's the foot. Back up, back up, back up, back up. How many steps did I take? Oh, God, I forgot. Four. Yeah. <laughs> dun, dun. Oh, three. Bill, is that you? <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's what you do. And they had an AD kneeling on the ground. Like, can you come down with me? And that, was, that was his job. Oh my that gosh. That meant I was stepping on the stone. And that man was Jim Kesselwise, who ended up being my producer on Silicon Valley. Oh, really? That was his first job, <laughs> was doing. <laughs> but Jim also failed up. Yeah, right? So yeah. he ended yeah, up on Silicon Valley. He's doing all right. The greatest shows ever. I'm going to sit back down again. Are you okay? You can That's follow awesome. me. Again. Yeah, he began by being a pointer. Now he's an A pointer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Have you ever seen any of the footage of the other days? Well, I, I, I saw the dailies. Oh, you yeah. watched the dailies? Yeah. I, w I would watch the dailies to see. That's that was back in the time when I did watch dailies. So. I mean, you, you guys really went back and filmed it at the start. Like you really yes. Did. Bill and I filmed in the original script. I almost lost my mind. <laughs> in the original script, there were about nine street scenes yep. of varying lengths and varying degrees as the day is repeated for Bill. And it ended up being, I think, like four, maybe. And uh, But Bill and I shot each one of those street scenes in different weather conditions. Mm. And you were about to tell the folks at home. Yes, the one day that, uh, that well, the, the one scene that is different weather. And it's, you're right, a very difficult actor. Uh, one that if you get your hands too close to their mouth. <laughs> no, not Andy McDowell. <laughs> not Bill Murray. <laughs> but the groundhog himself. The it was the, the truck scene, right? The truck scene. Don't drive angry. Yeah, the truck scene, the sun came out. Mm -hmm. So that is the one scene in the movie where Bill is putting the groundhog into the truck and suddenly the skies are kind of clear. There's sun on the truck. Don't drive angry. Don't drive angry. We had to shoot with the sun. So that's the only scene that had the sun. Because you didn't want to have to bring a groundhog out every time there was a different weather. Very expensive <laughs> to have that groundhog. Last time I was at Woodstock before the end of the world, and hold, holding the groundhog. And the mayor says to me in the clinches in the huddle, whatever 
you think the groundhog says to you. You say that the groundhog did not see his shadow. And I'm going, you mean this is rigged? <laughs> this is fixed? I was thinking the same thing. This it's is a why, hoax. It's a hoax. <laughs> this is why I never trust politicians. I don't care what they say. Stephen, thanks so much for your time. I mean, for bringing us to your lovely home and to be able to just kind of laugh, reminisce, yeah. learn some things. I'm leaving here with, man, I'm walking away with some wisdom, which is great. But uh, we have a lot more in this town that we want to see, the town that you and I have both come to love. Do you have something you want to share? It is a love story about the perfection of the human soul. I think what I love about this movie is it's just this whole, think about how do you be better? How do you just become a better person? What, you know, yes. you see the, you shift the focus from yourself. You think about others well, you want to do well for others. You right. want to be a good person. All sorts of groups, you know, cling to the message of Grandpa Greg. Like I said, Stephen, we're super grateful to be here at your home. Yep. Super grateful to uh, have some time with you and laugh and tell stories. And now we're headed back to Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs>